The empires of elves were incredible, the pinnacle of all civilization. After they came out of the Fey portals into the real world, they very swiftly dealt with the dragons and immediately started building their cities. This process of prosperity and glory, of elvish hegemony, lasted around 12,000 years. Most of their cities were designed for their particular sub-race of elves, so generally speaking you had a whole kingdom of dark elves, a whole kingdom of sun elves, a whole kingdom of green elves, etc. etc. It is, however, like it always is, would prove to be their demise, for they basically started fighting each other at the end of those 12,000 years. We call this process the Crown Wars, and they signaled at the beginning of the end of the elvish dominion. Now I can't really get into the whole thing because it is just a lot of political nonsense and many wars that just went in circles. The gist of it is that the Dark Elves were actually the strongest of all elves at the time and they were also incredibly greedy and they started to attempt to take over the other empires in order to govern Faerun themselves. They weren't the only ones fighting though, the Gold Elves were fighting the Moon Elves, the Green Elves were getting fought by multiple people, the whole thing was a mess. The initial aggressors of this whole conflict were actually not the Dark Elves, but it was a move made by the Dark Elves that changed everything. In order to obtain power and hasten the defeat of their enemies, the Dark Elves started making deals with demons. Demons who were in cohorts with Loth, the betrayer god. As the Dark Elves became infused with power and with the help of demons, they started to completely take over and destroy many cities until eventually, in their bloodlust, they completely submitted to the veneration of Loth, who started giving them more and more power. The other empires essentially banded together and prayed to Corlan, who agreed that the Dark Elves needed to be stopped and punished. With the help of the Sildarine, the Elves devised a massive, high magic spell that would curse every single Dark Elf, forcing them to be damaged by the sun and completely severing them from Arvandor, from their heaven. Yes, the curse of the Dark Elf was actually a high magic spell cast by literal elves. The curse turned the skin of the Dark Elf, which used to be kind of like a brown skin color, to a completely black skin color, and the hair turned completely white. The spell also forced them down into the Underdark. The spell could not differentiate between good or bad Dark Elves, so all of them were affected and all of them were cursed, unfortunately. The lore states that the Dark Elves lived in the Underdark first like animals, eating whatever they could find on the ground, until Loth herself and the Dark Seldarine helped them form their first cities and later empires beneath the ground. From that moment, the Dark Elves had been called the Darao, which translates to traitor in the Elvish language. Common races, of course, have adopted it, as you would imagine, to the Drow. Since then, the Drow have lost their link to Arvandor, their heaven. They no longer possess memories memories of their time in heaven whenever they trance, and instead, until they turn 30 years old, all they see in their reverie is complete and utter darkness. Quote, that drow do not experience trance the way other elves do lends credence to the idea that their souls do not reincarnate. Did Corlan forever bar the souls of dark elves from Arvandor and change them in some fundamental way? Or does Loth somehow weave new souls for her followers, in the way that Moradin forges new spirits for dwarves? Only those entities know for certain." End quote. Out of all of the gods that originally sided with Loth, only one ended up turning against her, Elistri. Those drow who see the terrors of drow culture and are repulsed by it can actually hear her song and seek her guidance. She guides those outside the tunnels of the Underdark towards the light of the moon and the beauty of the stars. It is not known what actually happens to the souls of the drow who side with her, but when such a drow dies, their body simply disappears, whisked away into air. Nobody knows where she lives or where the souls of her followers end up going. It is also interesting that Loth has mutated the drow even further than the curse afflicted upon them by their brethren. Female dark elves always grow taller than the males, and more muscular too. 
Elvish culture has always been gender neutral, as Coralyn Larethian has no defined gender, and even more so than that has always favored mutability and chaos, but Lold has also changed that aspect of the culture of the Dark Elves, transforming their culture into a matriarchal society where men are not allowed to ever rule above any female. Much like their god Coralyn, elves have a very small chance at being born androgynous, something generally considered to be a great blessing in their culture, and those that do generally end up becoming chief priests in their field. Dark elves still to this day get this blessing as well, however, those that do are forced to run away from the Underdark lest they be hunted down and killed. Dark elves cannot allow these such elves to exist, for it goes against the principles of Lolf and would prove a risk to the matriarchal society that they have formed. Plus, any blessing of Coraline is considered disgraceful in their culture, as you would imagine. On the other hand, being androgynous is actually one of the few things that will allow a dark elf into being accepted in normal, above-ground elvish society. So, back to the Crown Wars. What happened? Well, the Dark Elves were cursed and were forced to abandon their empire and escape to the tunnels of the Underdark, but that didn't stop the infighting. Much of the empires collapsed later in more wars until the gods intervened and put a stop to it. The Green Elves were essentially destroyed by the wars, and they were forced to intermingle with the other races of elves in order to survive. The resulting union of the Green Elves with the other races was actually what created the Wood Elves. The Wood Elves are not an original race of elves. Now, the Green Elves that didn't intermingle and went their own ways left to the southern part of Faerun in order to live in the trees by themselves. The lack of contact with their brethren and the erosion of their culture from the war forced these kinds of elves to get rid of much of their knowledge. Nowadays, we actually call them the Wild Elves because, well, they're, they're basically wild. They look primitive, they evolved from what they used to be, they only wield rudimentary magic and are a shadow of their former self. Shame, because they actually used to be the most peaceful kind of elf back in those days, and they were actually the nicest. But because they were the nicest, the other sub-races took advantage of them and killed them. Many gold elf kingdoms were destroyed in the wars, especially because they were the initial aggressors in the very first crown war, so they were punished severely by the Seldarine. Most of them left the mainland to move over to Evermeet. The moon elves scattered everywhere and are nowadays the most populous of all elves on Faerun. They live everywhere and can intermingle with all of the other races that would soon follow. The Wood Elves never accepted the call to ever meet as well and instead retreated to their secret fortresses and capitals in the woods, vowing to never again call upon high magic and to guard the leftover remains of their once great empire. Keep in mind, again, that Wood Elves are the descendants of the Gold Elves, of the Moon Elves, and of the Green Elves, who basically all just abhorred the wars and were ashamed of what they had done. They all got together, intermingled, made their own cities, and now thousands of years of doing that is when you actually get the Wood Elves the way that you see them, or the way that we call them now, Copper Elves. What was left of the Avarial eventually found an abandoned crystal fortress far, far, far away in the east, in the Ice Rim Mountains. They took over the Crystal Fortress and have been living there basically ever since. To this day, it is the only place where you can find a varial in the whole of Faerun. Now, to finish off the video, let's talk a little bit about Elvish anatomy, which I know is one of your favorite topics. Elvish eyes are very interesting because they possess a couple of tricks that normal human eyes do not. Obviously, the most important one is their ability to see in the dark. I know this is something that a lot of you probably ask yourself. How does the Elvish dark vision work? How can you see when there is no light? See, elves have a very, very strong connection to the weave, and many of them can even see the weave, albeit only in portions. When you have the ability to see parts of the weave, you can learn to distinguish how the weave interacts with both living things and non-living things. And it is through this practice that elves figure out how to see things in the darkness. From the moment elves are born, they are constantly taken to caves and dark fields to practice this very thing. They are shown rivers in the dark and taught how the weave affects it. They're shown elves in the darkness and taught 
how the weave affects them. The way the weave affects living things and non-living things is different, so one can actually tell them apart. This is a constant practice that takes decades to perfect. In fact, the lore states that elves don't really get good at this until at least their first century, so yeah. Elvish dark vision is something that they actually practice and learn to perfect. When their practice is done, they're basically able to sense life in the dark, they can see heat in the dark, and they can tell the contexture of the walls and floor and obstacles in the dark. Elvish eyes do a bit more though, other than being able to see parts of the weave, they are also more acute and discerning than the human eye. The elvish eye actually has the ability to focus tremendously on a single object, basically muffling everything else around it. This however has pros and cons. The, the pros are that the elf can study something while putting in basically 100% of its focus and attention on that something. The nature of the brain of the elf also allows it to sustain that concentration for extremely long periods of time. The cons of this ability is that elves tend to focus on one thing and everything else gets lost in the background. When an elf is trying to focus hard on an object, explosions could be going around the elf and the elf wouldn't even notice. This is why many elves get the stigma of being aloof and distracted. Many times they are too focused on something to respond to you asking them a question and this is why. By far the most interesting thing about the elvish anatomy though is their brain because it is also, of course, different from the human brain but in a very magical way. The elvish brain is believed to actually absorb the weave from its surroundings, keeping it stored within for usage. The biggest way the brain uses this stored magic is to communicate with other elvish brains in the area though, not necessarily to talk to each other as much as simply to connect with each other. See, elves believe wholeheartedly in the notion of community, in working for their culture and society and in being together regardless of the cost. An elf can actually sense when there is another elf nearby. They can feel that presence in their thoughts and that presence comforts them. Many elves are actually baffled and confused at how humans can endure being completely alone with their thoughts, something that terrifies many an elf. Just how you feel the warmth of your loved one when you're hugged, an elf feels the warmth of their community in their thoughts. Now, communion in this way can actually be enhanced, to the point where elves do have the ability to telepathically speak to one another and even read each other's thoughts, but they can only do this during a casting of high magic. We, we will talk about that on the next episode though. Most importantly, I, I want to focus on this communal thought hugs that they do. Quote, Elves seem to have some sort of mental link between them, and this too is linked with that mysterious gland in their brains. It cloaks their brains from influence, but it can also emit energy to allow another elf to project his mind into another's, and the two share thoughts on some level. The closeness of elven community comes from this habitual sharing of minds, and the elves do not understand other races without this ability, for they cannot conceive of being totally alone in one's own head. Apparently elves look forward to sharing their thoughts with others and do it either directly or in reverie. A reverie is a process similar to sleep, but distinctly elven where most races must shut their eyes and drift off to sleep to gain rest, both mental and physical, the elves activate their peculiar mental energy shields and this activates their reverie. Like sleep, their mind and their physical body are partially independent and all mental activity is internalized. Unlike sleep, an elf lies with eyes fully open, leading most humans to believe that elves never rest. While in reverie, elves mentally replay past events of that elf's long life, since an elf might forget much of his past over the centuries without moments of reflection such as this. Reverie also serves an important purpose in elven child rearing. When an elven woman is with child, she enters a state close to reverie when her belly begins to swell with child. From that time until her child is born, she mentally teaches her child of herself, the child's father, her clan, and colony history, and the basics of many languages. I firmly believe that this is why the elves grow so quickly and are such smart, well-behaved children. Having been born with the knowledge of their family and its past gives them a stronger sense of self, lacked by most races. 
According to some more religious elves, the Seldarine promised the elves a reverie-like communal mind link with the gods after the passage west, and there are few elves who can resist this idea. End quote. So as you can see, the magic that their brain absorbs allows them to do a myriad of things, from entering trance in order to rest, to resisting things like charm effects. I bet many people actually wondered how come elves are so good at resisting charm and sleep effects. Now, of course, the answer is because they come from the Feywild, but anatomically speaking, what exactly is the difference in their bodies that makes them negate those effects? And there you have it. They absorb magic in their brain, and the brain uses this magic to either cloak the brain or emit shields that protect it. It's interesting that the lore even states that elves actually do have the unique ability to be full spellcasters in spite of them wearing heavy armor. That being that, normally speaking, metal in your armor blocks your ability to grab magic from the weave. But not necessarily for an elf. Elves can actually grab the magic stored in their brain to cast some of their spells, completely bypassing the need to pluck magic from the weave. What's funny is that all of these things actually do go haywire whilst in fields of anti-magic. For example, the lore actually does state that an elf would have a very hard time seeing in the dark while under the effects of an anti-magic field, since they could no longer see the weave properly. But this would also theoretically affect their ability to resist being charmed or even their ability to enter a trance. All things that require the weave working properly for them to function. Let me tell you this, if something were to happen to the planet where suddenly everything was cloaked in an anti-magic field, the first ones to go crazy would most certainly be the elves. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to stick through, subscribe to the channel, because the next video is going to be a video on high magic. We're finally going to talk about how elves can actually achieve the ability to cast these extraordinarily powerful forms of magic and how they can do the things that elves do, which we can't really do following normal rules of magic. It's it's really interesting. Anyways, I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Rukato Fan, Daniel Luna, Dr. Cowbell, Skitsy Boy, Alisa Russell, Major Fail Gaming, Cody Herford, Saeliog, Barry Maskant, 5E Magic Shop, Doc Feeder, Daniel Umar, Morgan Johnson, Zach Powell, Brad Salazar. Gesher Nem, Rusty Rain, Biotechnofrag, Kush Bane, and Meaty Ogre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Guys, once again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to go and click on the playlist, watch all of those videos. They're all great, as good as this one, I promise you. Anyway, see you guys once again in two days to talk about high magic. See you then.